Yeah, cybersecurity certification is the magic word here for community community matters with Court Chambers, PhD, who runs the cybersecurity certification program at Hawaii Pacific University. Welcome to the show, Court. Uh, thank you, Jay. Uh, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad you're doing what you do, but but why should I care about cybersecurity certification? Um, you know, we've heard about hacking hither and yon. Um, is this course going to get us in a place where we can understand what that is and how to deal with it? Yes, I think um, it has become over the last decade a very important topic in the U.S. and throughout the world. Uh, we see so many of these cyber attacks take down major uh, critical infrastructure. Uh, and they also, uh, the cyber criminals uh, attack individuals as well. So uh, it's very important that we train uh, our young people, our uh, individuals going through college uh, in these cybersecurity skills and certifications uh, so that they can better protect uh, our critical infrastructure both here in Hawaii and nationwide. So uh, let me break that down to two parts. I mean, one is, is this certification going to help me protect my own data? Is it going to be able? Is it, is it going to be help me understand my my laptop, for example, so I have a, a lower risk? Absolutely, it will. Um, we start off with the first course, which is a CompTIA A plus, and what this course does is it it teaches you computer hardware and software. Uh, it teaches all three operating systems, Win Windows, Linux, and Mac operating systems. We also uh, teach you information about your mobile devices uh, and IT security, troubleshooting, how to correct those uh, issues when you have, uh, you know, your phone doesn't work as uh, planned and uh, how to reboot it, how to uh, go into your laptop and look at uh, your systems and uh, determine uh, what may be a problem and try to fix those problems as well. So uh, it will help you absolutely personally, and it will also help you understand the threat uh, that is out there uh, and how to mitigate that threat, how to protect your, your own personal uh, computers, laptops, uh, tablets from cyber attacks. Mm. So, you know, we, we've read a lot about ransomware. And ransomware seems to be, in, in substantial part, unstoppable. Um, I, I don't know enough about it to say why that is so. Um, but even in the, you know, the recent um, ransomware attacks, um, the FBI was able to stop it and recover the, you know, the, 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 the payments made to a, a part of the payments, not all of them. Right. And I just, um, I wonder, you know, how you deal with ransomware, because my, my perception of it, and uh, you, you probably know a lot more, is that it, it's not only from Moscow. It's not only from Vladimir Putin's gang over there. Uh, it's also from China, and it's from loan, loan, loan operators, loan wolves, so to speak, who get on the dark web and they find these tools and they set up a ransomware shop, and uh, they're operating by themselves or with their best buddy, but that's all. Um, and it works very well, and they could make a lot of money doing this and be um, completely immune from, you know, from being found and, and caught and prosecuted. Um, so, a uh, query, how do you deal with these very sophisticated but fragmented, you know, with distributed uh, groups of people who are anywhere and everywhere uh, dedicated to doing ransomware on you? Yes, absolutely. You hit, on, you hit on several really good points. Um, ransomware is one of the biggest problems we face today in cybersecurity, uh, and it is becoming a bigger problem. And you referred to the colonial pipeline attack um, that recently happened, uh, shut down the uh, uh, gasoline and uh, jet fuel uh, pipeline to the southern United States. Uh, and basically, like you mentioned, the FBI was able to recover part of that digital currency that they had to pay for ransom. Uh, uh, but what we face today is in, the, in you know, years ago, uh, you it would take a very highly trained or a technical person 
uh, like you mentioned, makes it maybe someone from a nation state, China or Russia or North Korea. But now uh, you don't even have to be uh, that uh, technical, technically trained, uh, a technical expertise, because what is available now on the dark web is uh, what is called malware as a service. So you can actually go onto these dark websites. You have a target in mind that you would like to attack. Uh, you can rent a ransomware attack, just like you would rent uh, a service uh, in, the, in the normal world. Uh, and then the software developers, criminal software developers who have developed highly technical uh, tools will do the attack for you uh, and then you will just pay them part of the profit, uh, a percentage of the profit. So uh, we've moved from uh, highly technical uh, criminals to low tech criminals who have access to these very highly developed uh, software developers that, that are making a huge profits on this malware as a service. So how, conceptually, you know, how, how can a cybersecurity professional deal with that? Either, you know, in a, I guess, individually or a small company or, or a large company. Conceptually, how do you stop it? Well, there are certain things you can do. Um, some of the experts uh, state that there's no way to completely stop it. In other words, if there is a nation state or a highly sophisticated criminal uh, actor that wants to get into your system, they probably will get into your system. Uh, what you're going to try to protect yourself from, or uh, again, you can't uh, protect yourself from the nation state actors, but you can protect yourself from uh, some of the other cyber criminals. Uh, one of the most important things to do too is to back up all of your information. So in other words, especially from ransomware attacks, um, if you have a a backup of all of your important data and you update that on say a weekly or a monthly basis uh, whatever's convenient to you but it has to be to a hard drive that is physically disconnected from your computer what we what we see is individuals will they'll do these cloud backups um, to maybe uh, microsoft or or to a google drive and you know they feel safe. They say, "Well, I backed up all of my information. You know, on a weekly basis, it's regularly backed up." But what the problem is, the the ransomware is so uh, so uh, sophisticated that not only will it encrypt the information on your hard drive, but it will move to that anything that's connected to your heart uh, to your computer, uh, even to the cloud, and it will encrypt those cloud uh, that cloud information as well. So, what we tell uh, companies and individuals to do is have a backup of their most important information, back that up on a regular basis and have it at it disconnected from uh, your computer on a, a, a hard drive, a, a portable hard drive. So basically you connect the portable drive, back up your information, disconnect the portable drive and stick it in the drawer. So then if you do get a ransomware attack that encrypts all your data and locks up your computer, uh, worst case scenario, you can just reinstall the operating system, put your backup uh, hard drive, all your information, back up your computer. That's, that's one of the safest uh, things to do. Um, and we also uh, tell people, really, if there is something that is that would cause such damage to you to be released uh, onto the open web or to be lost, just don't put it on a device that's connected to the internet. You know, I mean, because if, you know, if you have uh, files, uh, say you're a, a psychiatrist or a, a medical professional and you have all your files in the cloud and if you lost those files, it would devastate, or if those files were released to the public, it would devastate, uh, you know, your, your, your company. Um, just don't put those on a device that's connected. Is there progress being made? Maybe this is part of the, the certification training you're talking about. Is there progress being made in tools that will protect you? I'm not talking about, you know, virus protectors. I'm talking about something more sophisticated that deals with today's risks and threats 
from nation states and from individual lone wolves, uh, wolves around the world. Um, are there things you can put on your machine that will tip you off that somebody's fiddling with your data? Well, the, the new antivirus systems that you use on your computer, uh, they are uh, definitely uh, much more sophisticated than they used to be. They can block a lot, most of the ransomware. Uh, it's also important to always have your systems patched. You want to make sure that uh, your systems do auto patches. And we see this on our phone all the time. It will say your your app on your phone is going to update tonight at midnight, you know, um, uh, on your uh, iPhone or your Android. We also see this on our computer systems. If you have a Microsoft system, Microsoft says the big update is coming out tonight. It will update at midnight. So they're updating the systems. The new antivirus systems uh, work very well, and they will protect you from most of the uh, intrusions. But I'll tell you, Jay, you know what the biggest problem we find is, even if we have the technology to protect the systems, uh, the weakest link is always the human element. And when I say that is corporations can spend uh, astronomical amount of money protecting their systems with the latest software. Uh, and then their employees uh, may click on a phishing email, basically an email that is sent to them to trick them into clicking and downloading a link, which actually downloads uh, malware into their uh, computer, and then it moves laterally into the network uh, and infects the entire system. So um, that this is what's called social engineering. We've heard that term uh, several times, but the, the criminals know that some of the uh, antivirus software and the, uh, the anti-malware software is so sophisticated, it's very hard for them to get in. And then they use social engineering to go after the staff because they know if they can you know, offer a free iPhone, if you just click this link uh, and someone clicks that link, if they can get into that person's computer, then they can move into the system, create that back door and start Bling out all the data. So that's what we see is the um, companies also, not only do they have to invest in that software, but they have to invest in training for their, their workforce. Um, and we see this happen a lot. Uh, some of the training is they'll set up uh, fake emails. So in other words, uh, your staff will be doing their, you know, at their daily work at their desk and they'll get an email that says, um, the human resources department needs you to click this link to enter some information for uh, your upcoming paycheck, right? So they'll click that link and they'll get a pop-up on their screen that says, uh, you have just violated company policy by clicking this link. And then you have to, that individual has to go to retraining. So th those are some of the things they're doing to try to train the workforce that they have to be part of the solution uh, because it doesn't work with just software. You know, in the old days, uh, social engineering, uh, not that many years ago, was social. Uh, some fellow would call a secretary on the telephone. Right. And he would right. say, um, you know, my name is uh, my name is 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 Court Chambers, and uh, I, I work down the hall from you. You know me. I'm the I'm the fellow with the glasses and the beard. Uh, you know, and I forgot my password, and I wonder if you could just help me out. And you know that kind of thing, where he socializes somebody right. based on just a shred of information, and I guess right into the company up to high-level security. Sure. That was the old days. The new days is you get an email and you don't look, you don't notice that the the stated return address is different than the return address under it. Um, and I remember not too long ago, uh, the Israelis had some company that perfected it. Uh, a product that would actually, um, all you had to do was get the email. You didn't even have to click on it. It would, it, would, you would, it would come on your phone, and once you had it there on the screen, click or not, uh, it would do something. It would infect your phone. It was very impressive. Um, but, but social engineering now is much more than just socializing the secretary, right? Yes, absolutely. And also, just as you explained, uh, 
they use both. They, they do those calls, both vishing, uh, vishing calls, voice calls, uh, and they'll tell the employee, yeah, yeah, this is a tech department and we need you to do this or that or click on this link. Uh, uh, they'll also, uh, they'll use techniques They'll call like a lower level employee and say, hey, this is the vice president. I'm locked out of my account and I need you to help me to get back in because I've got this big meeting. And so it puts that uh, pressure on the individual. Uh, you know, oh, I just I'm, I'm new at this job and the vice president is calling me because he needs to get in that type of thing. So it puts pressure on them. Uh, they use those psychological uh, tricks to to trick the person into letting them in. They also um, actually physically enter the building. Uh, sometimes they can enter the building and do what is called shoulder surfing, where they actually go to a department and, and uh, they, they just observe and they watch people enter their credentials and into their computers. Um, and they can observe the, uh, all the physical security controls at the building. And then that gives them an idea of how they can break, break into that building or break into the Wi-Fi systems. So these are these are very strange and challenging times, you know, yeah. because we, we need these machines. We need the software. It helps us perform and compete. And, uh, and, and we and we don't think that we're a target, but we are. And so the certification program, I imagine, tell me, yes or no, the certification program you're talking about, which you're implementing at HPU, covers all of these things. It covers every, am I right, cybersecurity risk that you as an individual or a company or even a government agency uh, might have. Right? Yes, correct. Absolutely, Jay. Um, we start off with uh, four courses. Uh, basically, the first one is CompTIA A+, and this is that basic introductory course. Um, but it's, I say basic, but it's still very, very challenging course. Uh, so um, the textbook, just as an example, is uh, over 1,000 pages. So we go through 1,000 pages in eight weeks. So it is a lot of information packed into that eight-week courses. But we, we go over hardware and software and Windows and Linux and Mac operating systems. Um, and then we move on to CompTIA Network Plus, which uh, this course provides the knowledge and skills to troubleshoot and uh, configure networks uh, so that uh, individuals will know how routers work, uh, switches, um, how a packet travels through the internet. So they get that, that uh, first they spend in A+, plus. they learn computers, they actually learn how to build their own computer uh, through components if they would like to do that as well. Some of the people in our courses, uh, they build gaming computers, very high speed, they put uh, you know, advanced CPUs and cooling systems on them. Uh, but then we move into Network Plus where we, we discover how computers are connected on the network. And the network is one of the biggest vulnerabilities because that's where the, you know, if the threat actor can get inside our network within those security firewalls, then they can wreak havoc, uh, download all our information, hold it for, for ransom, or even spy on us. Uh, some of the malware, uh, often referred to as spyware, you know, it just sets up uh, operations so that it can use your, uh, your laptop camera, it can uh, turn on your microphone when they will, will want to, it can exfiltrate all your information, it can even key log all your strokes. So every stroke you uh, place on your keyboard, uh, the key logger records all of that and sends it back to the uh, threat actor. And that includes everything, including uh, your bank account, your passwords, your uh, all of your private information, your emails, your health information. So uh, that's what uh, Network Plus covers that networking portion. And then we move into the third course, which is CompTIA Security Plus. And what this does is then we take everything we learned uh, about computers and everything we learned about networks, and then we learn how to secure those devices. Uh, and because you have that background of networking, you have that background of computer components, it's much easier to understand how to secure them 
than uh, it would be if you were just starting off with just security. Uh, and we also teach the individual to think how the hacker would think. We use uh, different uh, tools. Uh, one of them is Linux Kali. Basically, it's a set of Linux uh, penetration testing tools. Uh, and we learn how hackers break into the systems. And we, we practice basically looking for vulnerabilities and finding those back doors and finding those open ports uh, so that the, the, the individual thinks as a, as a hacker. And then we finally move into a Cisco course called cybersecurity operations. And basically this covers network and operation attacks, uh, the types of data needed to investigate security incidents. It addresses how to monitor alerts and breaches to a network. Uh, and it trains the individual for a very unique job in today's world, which is um, basically working in a, what is called a SOC, a security operations center. And all large networks will have a security operations center. Uh, they will, it will be full with, uh, filled with technicians who uh, operate the security management systems, which basically monitors all of the systems uh, throughout the network. And you think about, uh, as an example, the state of Hawaii's network has uh, 30 to 40,000 uh, nodes connected. So if you can imagine the network with 40,000 uh, computers or devices connected, uh, and you have a team in that security operations center, which has to monitor all of those devices for security intrusions. Um, we also uh, cover uh, artificial intelligence that's now moving into the field, uh, which is a benefit, it's a huge benefit for uh, security technicians because it can uh, automate a lot of those manual operations looking for the security breaches. But we've also found that artificial intelligence has now made its way into the malware threat actors as well, and they're using uh, AI in their uh, to develop their um, viruses and their, their spyware. They even have what are called polymorphic viruses that actually, they're built with artificial intelligence and they can actually change their internal structure code once they enter your system. So if your system is, uh, it has um, uh, samples of the, uh, of the malware, and it's looking for those samples, you know, it's constantly looking for the samples that may enter the system. But, but this polymorphic viruses, they can change their code on demand to evade capture as it enters the system. Uh, so uh, like you said earlier, it's a very evolving field uh, and it's getting more and more challenging. Yeah, it sounds like Omicron, doesn't it? Yeah. Every time it's a virus to begin with, and uh, it, it, it mutates while you watch. Yeah. You know, right. This this takes me to an area that we really haven't discussed, and I wonder where it fits. Um, and that is uh, social media. Um, there was an article recently that was really scary. I, I, I think it was the Washington Post, but I'm not sure. Um, might have been a more techie journal. Uh, and it was about, I think, TikTok. Um, and how TikTok... We'll, we'll give you uh, movies. Actually, it, it might have been Twitter, too. We'll give you movies, and the, the movies will have a certain emotional charge to them. Okay. And, and if you watch the movie, if you click on the movie, it knows a piece of your, of your psychology. Okay. And then it's going to give you other movies. This is like, you know, if you've been browsing Amazon for a certain product, Next thing you know is you get an ad from some other source with a similar product that they know and is shared. And on. So in the, in the case of the movies, they know what you like. They know what turns you on or turns you off. They give you more movies. And every time they give you a movie, they're collecting data as to whether you watch it, how long do you watch it, and then it forks off. You know, it's like a logic tree. It forks off to more movies. And after a while, the AI organization um, that's doing this knows a lot about you. And it's not limited to what you're going to buy on you know, online shopping. It's, you know, it's your politics, your interests, your disinterests, and so forth. And this is happening now. 
And, and the movies, who would have thunk? The movies are an important part. Right? Amazon is going to look at what you buy, but the movie thing looks at what you look at, what you think, and the choices you make about the next movie. And I said, no, it makes you nervous about picking a movie, actually. <laughs> but, you know, I wonder, you know, if this is either in the cards now, as far as protecting you from your, your data and your personality, your psychology, your choice process, uh, or whether it will be in the cards later using, again, using AI. Yes, absolutely. Um, what we see is um, exactly what you're referring to, these tracking cookies. Uh, and what they do is they track your information exactly as you said, what, what movies you watch, what you shop for, and the social media companies, uh, they don't keep that internal, they sell that. And basically, so um, companies, the social media companies collect the data, they sell it to each other, and then it just builds those databases on you as an individual, uh, just as you said. So they have more and more information about you. And in fact, uh, the majority of the ads, uh, ad revenue that these social media companies make is from targeted ads. And uh, what it saves them a huge amount of money rather than broadcasting just an ad, say like on the Super Bowl, right, to the entire nation. They have such a database on all of the individuals on their uh, platforms that they can target that ad. They can only show that ad to the, the people they know would be interested in that information. So the, the targeting advertising puts them a step above other companies, say uh, news media, that would just buy regular ads, right? These uh, companies such as Google and Facebook, they can use these targeted ads using exactly as you had mentioned, artificial intelligence to target that advertisement at the people they know are gonna buy that, those products. And they use these tracking cookies and this spyware to basically um, build a profile of you. Uh, and also the cyber criminals uh, can get a hold of this information as well. And then they know much more about you and what to target and what to steal. Yeah, and, and they know your vulnerability. Yes. I mean, yeah. psychologically. So for example, if uh, you'd be a good candidate for a bubble of thought on, on the Republican side or the Democrat side, um, they can build that part of your bubble psychology. They can put you ostensibly in a bubble because they know you're vulnerable to that bubble and right. they can uh, affect your, your opinions um, and your sensibilities, your thought process, because you know these days, I want to add one more point. These days, um, we don't talk to people as much as we used to. We talk to the machines. Right. The machines talk to us. And so they could... They could have, they are having, in my opinion, they are having an effect on public opinion and on politics, not only in this country, but everywhere. Uh -huh. um, and that, you know, that is very troubling because it ultimately results in, um, it results in political outcomes, actually. Uh -huh. So the question is whether a, a, a close look at cybersecurity uh, is looking at these things, the social media phenomena, um, or whether it will look in the future at the social media phenomenon and this, this kind of mental game they play with us. Um, what do you think? What's happening? What will happen? No, I agree. I think that things are getting much more complicated. I think that it's going to be, um, uh, it's something that just cybersecurity professionals and law enforcement is bigger than that. Uh, we and actually we saw over the weekend that CNN uh, actually uh, did an interview that U.S. Cyber Command uh, is now entering into the uh, uh, to uh, basically go after these cyber criminal gangs and nation state actors that are attacking our systems. So basically the military has come in with their resources, which are vast, um, and they can strike back at these at these. Uh, malware gangs, cyber malware gangs, and nation states that are, that are using this technology. And something on the same line of thought you were discussing, uh, something that else is just over the horizon 
is something called deep fakes. And basically where they're using artificial intelligence to change video and to change photographs so that they can actually put different people in a video and have it look so uh, real that you cannot tell the difference. Yeah, we're doing that now, Court. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> we have an actor who who's actually doesn't look like you at all, but we are changing the <laughs> we're changing that person to look just like Court Chamber. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, amazing. Great. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me how I how I approach this with the cybersecurity training program at HPU. It begins next year. Yes. Um, the classes I'm sure are forming up now. Yeah. Uh, how do I apply? What are the prerequisites? What does it cost? When, when does it start? When does it finish? And uh, I know this is multiple compound question. When does it finish? And what kind of jobs can I get after I, after I complete the program? Okay, absolutely. Yes, it starts uh, January 10th uh, is our first A-plus course. Now, I've taught these uh, courses before uh, over the last five years. So, uh, but this will be the first time with HPU. Um, uh, and HPU is a great facility. I think the students will really love it there. It's a, uh, the latest state-of-the-art equipment, uh, the latest, uh, all, uh, you know, great classrooms. But again, we'll start January 10th with A+. Uh, and the courses, all right, I'll start with the prerequisites. There's no prerequisite. Um, you, you should have a basic uh, ability to use a computer and a knowledgeable, you know, to the basic level of computers. You start A plus. Again, is a very, very challenging course, but it's very doable. Uh, but it takes a lot of self discipline because we can't, we definitely can't cover everything in the course in the three hours that we meet per week. So the individual is going to have this, have to have the self discipline to put in another ten to fifteen hours. I say. I mean, it's uh, homework. Yeah, it's homework. Uh, to read the material, like I say, the the uh, like I said before, the the book is about a little over a thousand pages. We're going to go through every page in that book. We're going to learn the material. They're going to do a lot of homework, reading, um, and then at the end of the eight week period, you're not you you're not required to take the certification exam. So, in other words, if an individual wants to take the course. But they say, hey, you know, I just don't do good on tests. I don't want to take that that uh, certification exam. They're not required to. So basically, you'll go through the course. You'll you'll uh, pass the course. Uh, then you'll have the option to take that certification course. So we spread out the courses we to term A and term B. So in other words, term A they'll take a eight weeks A plus. Term B they won't. They'll have off. That'll give them time to study and prepare for and take that certification exam if they want to. Then we start the next course in term A of summer, that's secure, uh, Network Plus. And then we take eight weeks off the end of summer. And then we start Security Plus and Cisco Cyber Ops. By then, they should be pretty uh, familiar with the, the process. And we feel that they can take those two courses together uh, back to back uh, in the fall of next year. Uh, so at the end of next uh, Christmas, they would have four cybersecurity or four uh, information technology cert industry certifications, which are extremely valuable in the workforce today. Uh, and we believe that ups their chances astronomically to getting a job. And these are these are well-paying jobs. The Biden administration recently uh, announced that they are focusing on cybersecurity as one of the primary focuses of the U.S. government. Uh, and there's uh, approximately uh, one half million open cybersecurity positions currently in the U.S. The U.S. Uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, if you go to their website, you'll see the employment of information security analysts is projected to go 33% for 2020 to 2030. That's about 16,300 openings for information security analysts projected each year on the average over the next decade. Uh, many of these openings are expected to result from the need to replace workers who transfer to different occupations or exit the labor force. And these are very well-paying jobs. Um, 
CompTIA with a Security Plus certification, uh, did some research, and the starting pay is right around uh, sixty, fifty to sixty thousand dollars per year uh, for a for a security analyst with uh, several years of experience, four or five years of experience, you're looking at 100,000 uh, and 100,000 plus. So these are very good paying jobs, a lot of competition for the jobs, both in the government and in private uh, organizations. Um, typically they require an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree, uh, which we, we offer the associates now where we will launch the bachelor's degree uh, this fall. Um, the Biden administration has ha had several releases uh, of information over the last year. In, in August, uh, the private sector leaders announced ambitious initiatives to bolster the nation's cybersecurity. Uh, that's a fact sheet that is online. Uh, the administration wrote that the whole of nation effort is needed to address cybersecurity threats. Uh, we all know about the recent high profile cybersecurity incidents that demonstrate we are in need of a more cybersecurity. Uh, in May 12th, President Biden signed an executive order to improve the nation's cybersecurity. Um, it, they, we want to modernize and implement stronger cybersecurity standards for the federal government, uh, improve software uh, supply chain security. Uh, the solar winds attack we recently saw uh, last year uh, that infected several um, of the government's uh, top departments, including the Department of Homeland Security, the uh, Department of the Treasury. Uh, so, well, am I right from what you say that, but for national interest, it is better to have a. Um, well, it's a cybersecurity workforce. Absolutely. Um, it's, not, it's not only that we have a couple of smart guys doing this, but we have a lot of people who actually talk to each other and share their notes and tips and tricks and what have you. Uh, and, uh, and also they share the tips and tricks of the, of the bad actors as well. Yes, so right. we all know what's coming down the pike. The other thing, um, so, that's what we need to have. It's not just a matter of the government saying that we will now spend X dollars on cybersecurity. It's a matter of developing Akamai workforce uh, that will be smarter. You know, one thing that the U.S. has, and I think it still has, is a creativity. I'd like to dwell on that for a minute. Um, and the creativity is what will, you know, give us the excellence to deal with this, which is a great threat. And maybe sometimes we don't deal with it that well. Um, but if we have, you know, perpetuate the, this creativity in that workforce where a lot of people, students go into this and share and discuss and figure out new approaches or new defenses, um, we'll be better off uh, in many ways. And it is, it is a national issue. It's a, it's a critical vulnerability that we have to patch up. But the thing I was going to say is if you're talking about certifications, you're talking about tests with multiple choice and true false and all that uh -huh. doesn't allow for a lot of creativity. If I'm seeking creativity, you know, how can I achieve that within the context of the program you're talking about? Because I want my students, I want my workforce to be creative more than anywhere else as a group in the world. How do we achieve that? Well, I think we build creativity into the teaching process uh, again, like uh, teaching them to think like a, a hacker, like a hacker would think, uh, letting them use their creative minds to figure out different ways to attack a system, different ways to protect a system. And the individuals that have, like you were saying, that creativity, they need to fulfill that personally. Uh, you know, the world needs uh, individuals to go into the cybersecurity uh, development realm where they they get these certifications, they get on uh, hired with Apple or Google or, or the federal government or any of the large, huge corporations, and then they work to build better protection devices. They go into the AI field, uh, which is which is you know new, but it's developing at a at an exponential rate, um, and they can use their those creative skills to better protect all of us.
Yeah, that's, and, that, and let me take that last word, us. Um, us doesn't necessarily limit itself to the United States. No, not at all. I mean, with, with um, certification training and certificate, um, you're not limited to the United States because it's a global language. It's a global technology. You exactly. could go to France and get a job there, too. You have to learn a little French. Uh, <laughs> or anywhere in Europe and so forth. You have to you, you be anywhere. And, and so... Uh, it strikes me that if you're looking at the job possibilities here, it, it, it's you have to look far and wide because you could have a life anywhere. Assuming we're done with COVID, right? We're yeah, all, right, right. It assumes you can move around freely. But, but, I mean, is that what some of these students might do? Might they work for companies that are multinational uh, and that, and be assigned elsewhere? Or might they work for governments elsewhere? Absolutely. And, and you know what, uh, Jay, the great thing about the world we live in and, uh, is that a lot of these jobs have gone to uh, virtual jobs. So uh, you could get these certifications, get that degree. You could get a job with Apple making uh, a very good salary and live in Hawaii. A lot of Apple employees are moving to Hawaii. You could get that job with, the, uh, like you said, with a uh, cybersecurity corporation in Singapore, and you could live in Hawaii. Uh, and so the thing is about cybersecurity, uh, because all of our physical components, uh, one of the other courses that we're working on uh, developing for HBU that we hope to launch again in the fall is going to be a Cloud Plus, CompTIA Cloud Plus. And what that is, is cloud computing. So in other words, everything, all of our physical components are moving to the cloud. So it doesn't matter where you are in the world, uh, you can still do your cybersecurity position uh, because everything is moving to the cloud and there's not, is not the type of thing that you're going to be touching physical servers or touching physical switches. Uh, everything you do is going to be on the computer dashboard uh, and and that dashboard can be anywhere in the, on the planet. So uh, it just basically increases your ability to find a position that works best for you. Just like you had mentioned earlier, if you're that creative mind, you work in a uh, cybersecurity a corporation that develops uh, protective software. Um, if that's not your niche, if creativity is not your niche and you like to, to work uh, in a very structured environment, you work in a security operations center where everything is hyper structured, right, to protect those systems. So I believe that cybersecurity is going to offer those people with the self-discipline to get through uh, the courses, uh, the ability to, to choose a job, um, in, in, in multiple fields uh, and, and choose where they want to live as well. Yeah, but we would appreciate if they would not work for the Russians, uh, yeah. the Russian <laughs> hacker group in Moscow. <laughs> we right. really and would. <laughs> now, let me tell you, this is very interesting uh, when you mentioned that. Uh, have you heard of the word bug bounties? Oh, okay, so uh, now a current trend also in the cybersecurity field is what had happened is you would have very skilled people who uh, would teach themselves hacking skills. And they would just like you said, you know, they say, oh, I've got this great skill and and uh, I don't have ethics or whatever. And they would uh, start hacking. Right. And they would make a certain amount of money. Well, what what the uh, large corporations and even the government to include the Pentagon now offers is what they call bug bounties. And what this is, is a, is a bounty hunting rewards. So in other words, uh, under a structured program, they're able to try to hack into the Pentagon, try to hack into Microsoft, try to hack into Apple. And if they can find a vulnerability and, and uh, create a report for that vulnerability, they can win bug bounties. And these bug bounties are anywhere from a few hundred dollars up to $100,000 for one bug bounty if they find a vulnerability on new operating systems. So uh, this is also out there. So Very impressive. Yeah. Court, we're out of time. Uh, give you a website so people can learn more and then we'll have to close. All right, so uh, the best website to go to is uh, Hawaii Pacific University. 
uh, College of uh, Professional Studies. Uh, and you can just do a Google search, HBU, Hawaii Pacific University, uh, College of Professional Studies, and you'll see that uh, uh, certificate in cybersecurity and associate degree in cybersecurity. And I can give you a phone number too, if you'd like. No, we have, we're out of time and they okay. can look it up on the, on the web. Uh, right. Court Chambers, PhD, um, uh, the guy who's running the program, the guy who teaches a lot of the courses, we really appreciate you coming down, Court. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jay. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Aloha.